Laudato Jesus Christus, Vatican and World News. In the headlines this Friday, January 15th, tensions rise in the Middle East as Iran tests missiles over the Indian Ocean, U.S. bishops once again are calling for a halt to federal executions, and the personal ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham celebrates the 10-year anniversary of its foundation. In the Vatican, I'm Francesca Merlo. Reports from Iran say the military has fired long-range ballistic missiles into the Indian Ocean. Nathan Morley reports. Iran, which has one of the biggest missile programs in the entire Middle East, is now expanding its arsenal even further. These latest missiles were fired during an exercise in the country's central desert region and follow the testing of surface-to-surface ballistic missiles and brand-new aerial drones. The war games come at a time of rising tensions with the United States in the final days of President Donald Trump's administration. The chief of the Revolutionary Guards, Major General Hossein Salami, said the use of the long-range missiles against enemy warships and aircraft carriers was a defense policy goal. The missiles have a range of 1,800 kilometers and can now strike moving targets in the ocean. The chief of staff, General Mohammad Bakari, insisted that Iran had no offensive intentions but would now be able to respond to what he said would be any hostile or malicious act in the shortest possible time. There have been periodic confrontations between Iran's military and U.S. forces in the Gulf for the past few years, when President Trump abandoned Iran's 2015 nuclear deal with world powers and then reinstated harsh sanctions against Tehran. President-elect Joe Biden has said the United States will rejoin the nuclear deal if Iran resumes strict compliance. The U.S. Treasury on Friday announced new sanctions targeting Iran's shipping, aerospace and aviation industries. On Thursday, the second day of maritime drills by Iran's army, personnel spotted and captured on camera a foreign submarine which quickly left the scene after receiving warnings. The Iranians said the submarine appeared to be American. For Vatican News, this is Nathan Morley reporting. A cross-border rift is forming, with Mexico's president claiming that the United States fabricated evidence against a former Mexican Minister of Defense. James Blair's reports about the finger-pointing, which could cause serious bilateral cooperation issues in the war against drugs. Bolstered and reinforced by intelligence from the drugs enforcement agency better known as the DEA, U.S. authorities arrested former Mexican Minister of Defense General Salvador Cienfuegos at Los Angeles International Airport on October the 15th last year. They accused him of collaborating and colluding with a gang of narcos called H2, which is an offshoot of the Beltran labor drug cartel. The Mexican government, which had been kept in the dark about all of this, diplomatically went ballistic. So, U.S. prosecutors dropped all the charges and the 72-year-old general was hastily returned to Mexico under secure, close escort. The Mexican Federal Attorney General's office has just exonerated him, dismissing all accusations of drug trafficking and of allegedly accepting bribes. Mexico's President Andres Manuel López Obrador insists that the U.S. fabricated evidence against the general, he says. The Attorney General's office has resolved not to proceed with the accusations that were fabricated against General Cienfuegos by the DEA. Furthermore, President López Obrador asks why the arrest was carried out just before the U.S. presidential election, even though the U.S. authorities confirm they had been investigating the general for years and he previously traveled to their country. This latest twist has already badly ruptured trust and confidence, pains mistakenly built up between agencies of both countries over many years, widening markedly different perceptions of law and order, and threatening to undermine the cornerstone of justice. For Vatican News, James Blitz reporting. On Wednesday, the U.S. government executed Lisa Montgomery, the only woman on federal death row. Montgomery's execution was the first of 2021 and the 11th since last year. The government also executed Corey Johnson on Thursday for a series of seven murders in 1992. The Trump administration intends to execute its final inmate, Dustin J. Higgs, on Friday, who was sentenced to death for the 1996 murders of three women.
If the execution goes as planned, Higgs's death will be the third this week. Speaking to Vatican Radio in the wake of these three federal executions, Archbishop Paul Coakley, the chairman of the U.S. Bishops' Domestic Justice and Human Development Committee, expresses deep shock and concern over the sudden escalation of the application of the death penalty. I'm very concerned and certainly deeply disturbed but by the uh, sudden escalation of the application of the death penalty in these cases uh, in the United States, these federal cases. It had been 60 years since there had been federal executions uh, in the U.S., and historically there had only been four, and the last one being in 2003. Last year in 2020, there were 10 federal executions, uh, which was more than the combined total from all 50 states. So that's a, a very sobering and, and deeply concerning uh, set of facts. So we're very concerned about all of these cases, each and every one. The one of Lisa Montgomery uh, earlier this week was certainly a, a very tragic case, the first woman, I think, to be executed since 1953 in the United States. Uh, and the tragic element of this, of course, is that she had such a deeply uh, disturbing history of mental illness and a uh, lifetime of abuse. So th these are these are very uh, concerning facts as well. I mean, obviously, we're deeply concerned for the victims of each of her crimes, her crimes in particular, her crime for which she was convicted was particularly heinous. But uh, once again, we would say that um, one doesn't forfeit their dignity, uh, God-given dignity, uh, no matter how heinous a crime one might have been involved with. That was Archbishop Paul Coakley, chairman of the U.S. Bishop's Domestic Justice and Human Development Committee, speaking in the wake of three federal executions. In a telegram on behalf of Pope Francis and addressed to Bishop Claudio Cipolla of Padova in Italy, Cardinal Pietro Parolin has expressed the Holy Father's condolences for the death of Archbishop Oscar Rizzato, former papal almoner, who died in Padova on the 11th of January. In his message, the Cardinal Secretary of State writes that the Holy Father Francis wishes to express his closeness to this diocesan community, remembering with gratitude this discreet servant of the Church who, cultivating the interior life and attention to the weakest, carried out his ministry with humility and dedication, especially in the Secretariat of State and the Office of Papal Charities. The Catholic bishops of the Philippines are calling on the government to ensure a fair COVID-19 vaccination program with vaccines made in accordance with ethical principles and an, with a vaccine that is administered respecting each person's choice. The country's Catholic bishops made the call in a recent pastoral statement, as Robin Gomes reports. The pastoral statement signed by Archbishop Ricardo Bacay of Tuguegarao, chairman of the Office on Bioethics of the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines, CBCP, expresses support for the government's effort to procure and deploy the vaccines, thanking particularly the private organizations who have come forward to help acquire them. The statement endorsed by CBCP President Archbishop Romulo Valles of Davao urges the government and private organizations to commit to a vaccine distribution plan that prioritizes doctors, nurses, other frontliners and senior citizens who are at higher risk of infection. The Filipino bishops also commend the government policy of ensuring that the poor will have access to the vaccination program. The poor are the beloved of the Lord, they point out. They should be especially protected because their poverty makes them vulnerable to infection and severe disease. The CBCP points out that the COVID-19 vaccines will only be able to end the pandemic in the country if enough Filipinos are vaccinated. Hence, they urge all to be immunized when the vaccines arrive in the Philippines. However, the Filipino bishops point out that each individual person should be left to decide to choose to be vaccinated or not according to his or her conscience with full awareness of the obligation to protect oneself from being an instrument of contagion and the further spread of the virus. They also reiterate that deliberately procuring abortion, even if it is for the purpose of obtaining material for vaccines, is morally unacceptable. The CBCP had issued some guidelines in October saying that if there are several Several vaccines available, the government should prioritize those developed without the use of the morally controversial cell lines derived from the remains of an aborted child. Currently, the Philippines, which has the second highest number of infections and deaths in Southeast Asia after Indonesia, is negotiating the procurement of vaccines. I am Robin Gomes. 
And finally, on Saturday, the personal ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham celebrated its 10th anniversary with a solemn mass and the chanting of the Te Deum, the church's hymn of praise and thanksgiving. Due to restrictions in place to halt the spread of COVID-19, the ceremony live-streamed over the internet with limited physical participation of the faithful. The ordinariate was established on the 15th of January 2011 as a direct result of Pope Benedict's apostolic constitution, Anglicanorum Cetibus, the Church's response, to the desire expressed by groups of Anglicans to be received into full communion with the Catholic Church. Pope Benedict wrote in the Constitution, The successor of Peter mandated by the Lord Jesus to guarantee the unity of the episcopate and to preside over and safeguard the universal communion of all churches could not fail to make available the means necessary to bring this holy desire to realization. Our Lady of Walsingham was the first ordinariate to be established under the provisions of Anglicanorum Certibus, and for the 10th anniversary, the first ordinary, Monsignor Keith Newton, spoke with Vatican News about the gifts the ordinariate brings to the Church. Well, I suppose it's a question that ought to be asked by others uh, outside the ordinary rather than those within. I mean, I, I would like to think that we are making a contribution. I mean, I think we are prophetic in pointing the rest of the church to ecumenical possibilities. I mean, the, the ordinary is the first time in the history of the Catholic Church that uh, groups or a, a ecclesial body, which was forged in the years of the Reformation in the West, mm -hmm. has been brought back, just a part of it, into the full community of the Catholic Church, bringing with it some of its traditions. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that I know is that we have our own missal, which was promulgated by Pope Francis. Um, and uh, this uses, although it uses much from Catholic liturgy, it also uses elements of Anglican liturgy, which were, were part of the Anglican prayer book, particularly the Collects, which are in very beautiful English. So we, we are off in this, and I think it, its significance is ecumenical, really. Uh, and also to bring something of Englishness uh, into the Catholic Church. I mean, that's the, the, the Book of Common Prayer and, uh, and the Anglican Church are very much the part of, of English life here. And often in the past, Catholicism has seemed to be quite foreign. And it's important to, to show people that actually, to remind them, that England was a great Catholic country uh, before Henry VIII. And there are traditions going back to them that we need to refined and remind ourselves of. The Catholic Church did not begin in England and uh, Wales in 1850 when the uh, hierarchy was uh, restored. So we, that's the sort of gifts I think, but I always think it's probably better for other people to say, this is what we think you're bringing rather than me in a rather superior way saying, this is the gifts we have. That was Monsignor Keith Newton, the first ordinary of the Ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham. And that brings us to the end of this edition of Vatican on World News. For more on these and other stories and to hear this broadcast as a podcast, please be sure to visit our web portal at www.vaticannews.va. You can also like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. Many thanks go to Mario Scatton in studio. In the Vatican, I'm Francesca Merlo. <laughs>